Good morning, church. Hey, I am, I am Adam. Thank you uh, for all of your prayers and calls and texts and stuff. Uh, last week I was down with strep throat, which wasn't fun at all, uh, but I'm over that now. So welcome to The Crossing. Uh, our mission here is developing devoted followers of Jesus who will develop devoted followers of Jesus who will just go, keep going just developing devoted followers of Jesus. And, and part of that process happens right here during Sunday mornings where we get to be together and dig into God's word and invite him to just speak into our lives uh, his truth. This month we've been in a, a sermon series called Wordle. A Wordle is just an app where you can, it, you can put in like a paragraph and it generates a word cloud. You put in a paragraph, or in our case, a, a passage of scripture, and it generates a, a cloud of words uh, in a really fun and colorful way. And so for May, we've, we've been using passages uh, in the Bible to highlight one single word that we really want to learn more about, oh, words, words that typically uh, are used a lot but, but may not really be clearly defined for us. And so far, we've dug deeper into worship. Worship, our, our personal bowing down or, or in response to, to who God is and, and what he's doing and what he's done. And then we've, we've dug into the word love, kind of understanding love's not really a feeling, but rather a choosing for others of what God would, would choose for them. Last week, Mark explored faith and how biblical faith really is more than just believing in something. Rather, it's always a combination of, of conviction and trust and obedience. It's, it's really faithfulness. And so here I am with, with the last word in our Wordle sermon series, and when Mark asked me to, uh, to preach about this particular word, I'll be honest, um, I felt like he was sticking it to the intern. <laughs> You'll understand why in a moment. But, but the more I've studied and prepared for today, oh, how that feeling has changed. Uh, and, and honestly, I think we may have saved the best for last. Are you ready? Today's wordle is on the word repentance. <laughs> That's kind of my feeling, the squirming and the sighing and the like, wait, what? <laughs> really? And here's why you may feel like I do. You see, we love to shout worship and shout love and shout faith, but we like to whisper. But can I tell you something? Repentance. Life is all about repentance. Our word of this morning comes from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, where it says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Verse 11 goes on, see what this godly sorrow has produced in you, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. And, and that's repentance. When, when you have a brokenness that leads to an earnest eagerness to clear your name, when you're angry, you're alarmed at the injustice that you've caused, that you've done, that your sin has, has bore out. The word repentance is used over a hundred times in the Bible, but the principle of repenting is taught, get this, over a thousand times in Scripture. A thousand times. The Greek word in the New Testament is metanoia. It means to change your mind. It means to make a decision to turn around toward a new direction. When we, when we read it in the Old Testament, it's most usually uh, translated as as return, where, where God and through his prophets are always saying, hey, leave your idols and return to God. Leave this way and return to God's way. Repentance, it's a change of mind that results in a change of behavior. One si overly simplified way to remember it is I used to do that, now I do this. But I think we ought to dig a little deeper because if the Lord's going to repeat himself over a thousand times, <laughs> it's a pretty big deal, Right? Jesus talked about repentance. In fact, his very first words of ministry on planet earth, God comes to earth, the very first words he's preaching, Mark 1.15, repent, believe the good news. Or how about this one from Luke chapter 13, verse 3, I guess he's really trying to get our attention and, and how serious this is. He says, unless you repent, you too will all perish. Somebody say, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's a, wow, okay, let's jump right in that one. You're going to die. Jesus also said it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus came here to call us sinners to repentance, to change our minds, to turn toward a new direction. And if we don't, we will all perish. That's some heavy stuff, right? Repentance, it's, it is a big deal. It's foundational. It's such a big deal that you frankly can't understand Christianity apart from it. So I want to take us back to a story today in the life of a king that, that I think will help us really understand this word repentance. And it all started with a parable. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan to David. And when he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him, from, and with him and his children. It shared his food. It drank from his cup. It even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now, a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man, and prepared it for the one who had come to him. Say, that's messed up. Nathan, the, the prophet, shared this parable with King David, and, and rightly so, David was just outraged at this injustice, right? It was nothing compared to what David had done. David sent his armies into battle while he stayed home, one day he was out on the veranda just walking around and he saw his friend Uriah's wife taking a bath. And so he sent his men to go get her and bring her to him. And he committed adultery with her. And she became pregnant. And so to cover up his sin, David called Uriah back from the battlefield to come and be with his wife. But his loyalty to his boys who were still fighting on the battlefield kept him from her. And so change of plans, David writes a letter to send to uh, his commander back on the battlefield and sends it back to the battlefield with Uriah. He never read it. And in that letter were instructions for, Uriah, for David's commanders to put Uriah on the front lines where the, the fighting was fiercest and then withdraw all the troops so that he would be killed. So that's even more messed up. David committed adultery, he lied, he committed murder, and then just went about life. But God saw. God knew. Almost a year later, God sent Nathan with this parable to confront David about his sin. And verses 5 through 7 of 2 Samuel chapter 12 record David's response to Nathan's story. It says, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must, he must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This story's about you. You're the man. And David was silent. He was crushed. The, the, the reality and all the emotions from what it all came flooding back and, and he was just crushed, guilty. What do you do when you know you've done something wrong and you don't know the path forward? When, 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 when you feel hopeless and you feel lost, and you can't undo what you've done, but you can't go on living with it either, what do you do? You repent. True to form, a man after God's own heart, not only does David repent when confronted with his sin, he writes down his prayer for you and I to learn from. Psalm chapter 51 is David's prayer of repentance. And so I want us to work our way through Psalm 51 for the rest of my time and just get a clearer picture of what repentance is and what repentance does. Is that cool? First, what repentance is. Repentance is a turning from our sin. The first five verses of Psalm 51, listen to this. David says, have mercy on me, O God, 
According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all of my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you're right in your verdict. You're justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Seeing the sins of other people (laughs) is real easy, isn't it? It's real easy. Seeing our own sins can can be pretty hard. It took David nearly a year and a prophet from God to see his. And when he did, he used strong words about himself. He he turned, he he refused to place blame. He refused to make excuses. He owned up. In these first five verses, David admits his sin, my transgressions, my iniquity, my sin. In his transgressing, that word means he knowingly stepped over the law. In his iniquity, he he twisted what God had made straight. In his sin, he missed the mark of what God had had deemed as righteous. And then he calls these acts what they are, evil. In verse 5, David confesses he's always been a sinner. It's just in his nature. He was just born with his innate bent toward sinning. Not that he was born sinful. We're not born sinful. But that we're born selfish and we have this fleshly desire that at some point we're going to fall. Every one of us understands that, right? And repentance begins when we start using the words I and my. Realizing and then personalizing our sin creates godly sorrow over it. And we start hating our sin when we see what it does to our relationship with God. The fact is, listen, we'll never turn from a sin we don't hate. So we need to see that sin is always first against God. Every sin you and I have ever committed is because we loved something else more than we loved God. That's why in verse 4, David says that his sin is against God and God only, that that God is right to judge him. Uh, He's right. (laughs) He's guilty. Notice what David's saying. He's saying, look, he committed adultery with Bathsheba, but the first sin of adultery he actually committed against God. It's not like David went from this perfect and sinless man straight to murder. Doesn't happen that way, does it? Casting crowns would say it's a slow fade. Right? Often our fall happens more subtly, but the first step is always cheating on God. What if, what if David would have repented of his lust before he sent for Bathsheba? What if, what if David would have repented of his self-assurance before he stayed home and sent all the guys off to war? What if he had turned from his pride before he overlooked the city that he ruled? You see, the earlier we repent and turn from sin, the safer we'll be, the, the less deep into it we'll get, if you will. Repentance is a turning from sin, and it's a turning to God. See, if we think that repentance is only turning from sin, we won't ever do it. <laughs> we can't. It's too ingrained in us. We need, we need a power that's greater than our sin. There was this preacher and author in the 1800s, Thomas Chalmers, and he said, he wrote this book, and he said, we need the expulsive power of a new affection. We need a greater love to drive out our love for sin, and there is no greater love than God's love. You and I need to understand God's heart toward us. David got it. That's why he could come to God in this moment of brokenness and plead with him, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. And David turns to God in humility, in submission, trusting in God's faithfulness even when he had none of his own. Trusting that God could and would cleanse him and wash away his sins and guilt and shame. He turned to God pleading with him to not just change his heart, but to remake it all together. Listen to what David said. Listen to his turning to God in verse 7 through 12. He said, God, cleanse me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. We can hear the essence of repentance in David's prayer, right? 
God, I, I messed up big time. Fix it. Fix me. I, I need you. I, I need help only you can provide. I realize what I've done, and I'm sorry, and, and I'm hurting. Don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. This hurts a little, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Repentance hurts a little. But you see, in our repentance, uh, God doesn't abandon us. He heals us. But it's not painless. There are still the natural consequences from our actions. It's not painless. Like, like in, in C.S. Lewis's book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, there's this, there's this selfish kid. His name's Eustace. He's just, he's a selfish kid. He's a jerk of a kid. Like you want him to, to lose. He's that guy. He doesn't care about anybody else around him. He's so enthralled with treasure. One night he's got this gold bracelet around his wrist and, and he goes to bed. And in that night he's transformed into a dragon. Kind of, it's not even kind of, it's, it's, that's who he is on the inside. It's a manifestation of who he really is. He's a dragon of a kid. And so when they wake up the next morning, nobody knows where Eustace is or who the dragon is. Of course, they cast him out. He's, he's, he's cast away from all humanity all by himself. And in this moment of loneliness, he begins to cry out. And when he does Aslan, that's this great lion who represents Jesus in the book. He hears his cries and he comes on the scene to offer to help Eustace remove his, his, his dragonness by removing the dragon's skin. Eustace has tried to do this, of course, because yeah, I don't need any help. But he couldn't. It didn't work. He couldn't get rid of his own dragonness. So Jesus, I mean, Aslan steps in. You see, Aslan wasn't unwilling to clean. It was Eustace who wanted to do the things on his own. He wanted to fix it on his own. He wanted to do whatever he could do by himself. And when Eustace finally asked for help, when he finally cried out, when he finally turned to the one who could help, help came roaring in. And when we repent, when we turn away from our sin and turn to Jesus, he's right there to de-dragon us, to cleanse us. In repentance, we're trusting God to be all who he promises to be, the, the heart cleanser, the, the spirit renewer, the Holy Spirit giver, the joy restorer, the, the life upholder, the sin remover. That's what repentance is, turning from sin and turning to God. And that, will, that changes us, which is what repentance does. It, it changes us. If we go back to 2 Samuel chapter 12, when Nathan confronted David with, you're the man, David confessed, I've sinned against God. And God, through Nathan's immediate response is, the Lord has taken away your sin, you will not die. And I just think that exchange happened right before verse 13 in Psalm 51. Because David's tone changes in, in verse 13. David's gotten it all off his chest. He, he's turned to the Lord in the first 12 verses. He's trusted in God's faithfulness to forgive and restore. And he was changed. Verse 12 ends, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then verse 13 continues, listen for the change. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You don't delight in sacrifice, or I'd bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Did you hear the change? Repentance changes us turning away from our sin and turning to God puts our life on a different course. You're literally going in a different direction from what you were. Your direction has changed. Your mind has changed. You now, now you really get it that, that, that you can't do it on your own and you're okay with that. In fact, you're thankful for that because you know the one who can. I'm sorry. I got caught up. You begin a new life a new way. You're not doing it alone. Jesus is walking with you, leading the way, preparing the way, making the path straighter for you. Listen, you can't, you can't have this happen and not be changed. David said, I'm going to teach others that they can, so they can repent to you, that they can turn back to you. And I'm no good at singing, but I'm gonna, I can't help but sing. You're just that good. I've been quiet for a while. I've been ashamed 
Open up my lips. Not anymore. I'm going to declare your praises. And remember 2 Corinthians? Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. Made brand new. Repentance does that. It changes us. And because it changes us, it also changes us. Think about that for a second. The lot of us, the whole church, the kingdom of God is built through repentance. Psalm 51 is proof. Can you imagine having your greatest sins recorded and read forever? The answer is no. <laughs> That'd be horrible. But in the same breath, can you imagine the Bible without Psalm 51? Through repentance, we become experts in the mercy and grace of God. Through repentance, God builds his church where where all people can come and find love and forgiveness and a family to do life in Christ with forever. That's who we are here at The Crossing. We're a whole bunch of people who have messed up our lives. And so when you mess up your lives, welcome, join us. Because we people that mess up our lives, but we have found grace and forgiveness in a God who is faithful to our turning to him. Repentance changes us individually, and so it also changes the whole family. And aren't you grateful for that? It's a big deal. I I can't help but look at this story of David and wonder, why? Why why would God grant David this, this, this amazing grace he didn't work his way into it. He, he couldn't bring Uriah back from the dead. The natural consequence from his sin with Bathsheba was that their son would die when he was, he couldn't bring his son back from the dead. He couldn't undo the adultery he had committed with Bathsheba. He couldn't change anything in his past. He couldn't do anything in the future to make up for all the stuff he'd done. The simple fact is David turned. He He repented. In his anguish, in his guilt, in his shame, David turned to the Lord, not from him. And that ought to teach you and I something this morning. Listen, you can't sin your way so far from God that you can't return to him. You're never so far from Jesus or so bad that he can't or won't save us. Because that's what he does. He saves sinners. Remember Jesus' first words of ministry? Repent. Believe the good news. Well, after his resurrection, he hung out for a little bit, and then he just kind of just left. And all his boys were were hanging out in this upper room in Jerusalem because he told them not to do that. And and he sent his, his Holy Spirit down on them. And that day, Peter stood up and he preached the very first sermon that we have after Jesus left earth. And he got up and he just like, he just gave it to the people. I mean, he just, (laughs) he said, hey, you killed that guy. Remember that just a few weeks ago? You killed that dude, Jesus. When you did that, you killed God. Y'all are wicked. It's a great way to start a church. And a group of them heard what he said. And the Bible says they were cut to the heart. Much like David, when Nathan was like, you're the man. It was like, I get it now. And they asked Peter, man, hey, hey, what do we do? How do we fix this? We're guilty. How do we, how do we deal with this guilt? How do we make it right? Can you guess what Peter said? Repent. <laughs> Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Guys, God's word doesn't change the command to repent and be baptized, the promise of forgiveness of all of your sins, past, present, and future, and the gift of God's spirit living in you is the same for you and I today. You see, the desire of God's heart, the Bible says, is for every person to turn to him, to repent. That's why he hasn't wiped out the earth yet. If you're wondering why not, that's why. He's waiting. Repent and be baptized, be made new, born again, putting to death the old you and letting God raise you up a brand new person, totally free, totally forgiven. And if that's something you need to do today, repent for the very first time, like let's get it done. What are you waiting for? 
It's the same promise. It's available for you. Talk to me. Talk to somebody. And find yourself in the prayer room. Like, let's get it done today. And maybe today you've already done that. You've repented the first time. In repentance, you do one time initially to Jesus. You turn to him, and then it's a constant thing the rest of your life. Maybe you just need a fresh reminder that repentance is still available, even though you seemingly have walked away from God. You seemingly have just ignored him because you're doing your own thing. Turn to him and find life brand new life, repentance, it always results in new life. My new friend Matt helped me understand that it actually results in a wordle life. I had you until then. Like, wait, what? Listen, when you repent, when you turn from your sin and turn to God and you're changed, you are then overwhelmed (laughs) by love. You understand it the love God has for you, and you're filled with with faith in a God who is willing to give his only son for, for you, which leads you only to a place where you are more frequently ready to worship. Yeah? To respond to God because of his goodness. Nothing because of you, because of how good he is. The word of life. Let's pray about it. Thank you, Lord, for... This sermon series has been so fun, digging a little deeper into your word. How, thank you for helping us understand uh, the things that you've, you teach us. And today, not necessarily the most exciting word to anticipate, but wow. <laughs> Maybe the most powerful. That we can turn to you. That we don't have to stay bound up in our sin, in our struggle, in, our, in the things that we just we feel like we're, we're consumed by and controlled by. You have the power to break those chains. You've already done it. And we see in David's life who you call a man after your own heart, and it's hard to understand that when we see the things he's done. It's the same as us. Through him you've taught us we can turn from our sin and turn to you and be changed and have brand new life. And for that, we're thankful. In the name of Jesus, amen.